Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1971 Italian giallo film, The Fifth Chord. And if you're big into giallo films like I am, it's my one of my favorite subgenres of horror. I have a whole playlist on my channel of all the giallo films I've reviewed to date. Uh, I'm almost up to date on all of the giallo films on Shudder. After this review, I have one more to go, and then I have them all. So if you like giallo and you're watching them on Shudder, I probably have a review for the film. So let's talk about The Fifth Chord. Now, this was directed by Luigi Bazzoni, who also did horror film The Possessed, which I have not seen. Uh, written by Bazzoni, but also Mario Finelli and Mario DiNardo. Now, Mario DiNardo has also worked on the scripts for Death Knocks Twice, Five Dolls for an August Moon, which I have purchased and will be reviewing, The Two Faces of Fear, The Cauldron of Death, Yeti, Giant of the 20th Century. So those all sound like fun names. That's one of the things. These Italian horror films back then typically had really good names, especially the Giallo films. Real interesting names. So this is based on a novel by David McDonald Devine. Um, I couldn't find um, anything else that was really based off of their work movie-wise, so just know that. Uh, the Italian title for this film, or alternate title for it, is Black Day for the Ram. This is what I'm talking about, about these titles. Very interesting titles. I like that. I think I like that title more just from a what it sounds like standpoint, but the fifth chord I think is also okay. Um, but Black Day for the Ram, I think, just sounds more cool. I don't think either of them really matter to the actual story. Like, they don't really tie in, but, you know, that's a thing. Critics chided this film for having too many red herrings and being too convoluted. Now, I am going to agree with the critics on this one. For the most part, this is too convoluted. There are too many red herrings. There are too many characters in this film. And not only are there too many characters in this film, there are too many characters in this film introduced immediately. Uh, you know, it starts with that New Year's Eve party, and it's just going from character to character to character to character. And it's showing little clips of these characters, and then jumping to the next one, jumping to the next one, jumping to the next one. So it feels very choppy. It feels like it's moving at like a breakneck neck pace. And one of the biggest problems with that is that you need to establish who these characters are, let the audience soak that in, under you know, get their names, understand who they are you know, see some interaction to get a feel for who they are before you're going to introduce a bunch of other characters. Now, you can do, like, two or three characters in the beginning if you're going to kind of, like, have them have a conversation and then you get to know who they are and all that stuff, but they're not doing that. Like, it's just like, here's a quick little ditty with this guy, now this person, now this woman, now... And it just kept going, going, going. I was just like, oh my gosh, slow down. There's way too much coming at me. I'm not going to know anyone's name. I'm not going to know who anyone is. This is going to be very confusing. And it is kind of a confusing film for that reason. Uh, the other thing is, like they're saying, too many red herrings. But uh, It's partially because of having too many characters and having too many characters who they tried to make look suspicious at different times. And um, some of the characters ended up, in particular, just seeming like they really shouldn't have been there. Um, so I think they really should have, with the script, can cut down on the characters. You can have a good amount of red herrings, but don't have it be just like a red herring that just goes off in this tangent that then doesn't really tie into the story so much. Like, you can have all these red herrings but still have it tie into the story. And a lot of Giallo does that well. This one does not, unfortunately. Now, that said, I do have a lot of things that I enjoy about this film. There are just a lot of things that kind of irk me, like... Too many red herrings, too convoluted. Uh, also, at times, too slow, uh, which you get that with all those extra red herrings. So anyway, the slowed voice recording in the beginning uh, it sounds very creepy. I think it's very effective. I think it's a cool way to start a Giallo film. That really pulled me in because it sounds scary. It sounds creepy. The other thing is, if you're listening to actually what's being said, they're telling you what's coming. They're telling you what they're going to do. And to hear it directly from the killer is a really cool way to set everything up, especially because with a lot of Giallo films, it's very seldom that you hear from the killer prior to the end. You know, most of the time when you're hearing from the killer, you're just kind of hearing these whispers, and a lot of times you can't even make out what the actual words are now with this one you're hearing a lot of words yes the voice is distorted I mean you have to do that but 
it's um it's very chilling because it's the killer and you know this is going to be the killer and you're getting into their mind a little bit and that just does not happen with giallo films in general and i like that they went a different route in that way because i think it just it, it's a better setup in my opinion it's cool um yeah so i like that quite a bit lots of people looking at each other at the new year's party uh, it made me think there were many love triangles or maybe just one polygon. Love polygon. Um, so I, it, thinking that early on, and I do these these notes and I read them in order of when I'm putting them down. So when that scene was going on, in the very beginning, I put that down. So I, I ended up being right about that to agree, and that ended up playing to who the killer was in the end, which was John Lubbock, the guy who ends up getting jumped He's the first person who has any sort of violence against them. Uh, he ends up getting jumped under or in that tunnel. And then I think obviously that's done so that people assume he is not the killer. They'll say, well, I mean, who would, you know, obviously someone's after this guy. So it's probably the same person who's killing people, but no. But anyway, so John um, ended up being interested in... Isabel's husband who I forget I forget what his name was because there's too many characters and I don't even think you really see Isabel's husband all that often but that was very very much telegraphed in the New Year's Eve sequence where you know John's staring at the couple and he's staring at Isabel first so it's supposed to make people think that he's like interested in her and then uh Isabel's husband like looks up it, it, husband or lover I don't remember looks up at him and makes eye contact and it's that moment where he like runs to the bathroom and he's getting all upset uh it looks like he might be sick so you know the groundwork was laid there so that at the end you look back and you're like oh okay that makes sense i don't like how there are so many cuts to characters immediately in the film uh it's better to introduce one by one or two in a conversation like i was saying when andrea kissed his part-time lover lou it was disgusting. Like, that is the worst actual face-sucking or attempted face-sucking I've ever seen. It was the most non-sexy kissing scene I've ever seen in a film. And then when he ends up kissing, I believe it's um, Helene later in the film, same situation. That actor in, partic in particular who played Andrea, gross kisser. I, I don't know if that was just his acting, that's how he did it with when he's acting, or if that's in real life, because it's like overly aggressive, it's like he was trying to eat their face. Not good, not good. The worst, like I said, the worst kissing I've ever seen. It made me laugh the second time I saw it, but the first time I saw it, I was just like, what? What is happening? But anyway, yeah, just a small thing. Observation. This film jumps locations constantly. This goes back to my thing about the breakneck pace. Uh, location scouting must have been horrible for this, for that reason, because they shoot it in many, many places. Now, for that reason, I think it's cool that you see all this architecture of the time. And I will say that for a lot of the uh, cinematography, the particular shots that they set up with the camera work, they use architecture in cool ways. And a lot of what they do is they use the shapes, the geometry in architecture that look interesting to frame shots, to just have cool designs within shots. Um, cinematography is great. This film looks really good. Great directing, great cinematography. Um, for the most part, the acting was quite good too, except for the face sucking, but yeah. Um, but uh, locations look great. Like I, I, I love that aspect of it. And I, I like the fact that it is kind of a journey to all these different places, but at the same time, like they're just do it in like these short little bits and that just makes it feel choppy once again and just kind of moving a little too fast. So yeah, Andrea establishes himself as a really pushy ass early on. He has a terrible attitude. He's a terrible person. Um, he's drinking all the time. He's drinking and driving very early on in the film. Uh, and I think it was intentionally done that way so that, you know, the audience wouldn't view him as totally good so that he would also be seen as a potential, uh, suspect for being the killer. Uh, especially because they bring up the whole fact that, you know, he has ties to these people 
who are getting killed, and he also um, has no alibi for the first murder, the night of the first, or the, the, the first night's attack on John Lubbock. He has no alibi except, I was drunk, I remember nothing, <laughs> which is not an alibi. It's actually more incriminating than anything. And the fact that the police don't really do much with that, like, they they literally even, like, have a conversation where they're just like, well, you know, we're not gonna, you know, press you on this or, or arrest you or anything at this point, you know, just whatever. It's like, okay. But yeah, I think he's intentionally set up for that reason to be a, a not good person. And then it goes to, like, the next level when he slaps his lover Lou off her feet, literally off her feet. He gave that huge slap and she, like, flew over onto the bed and I was like... Okay, you know, I hated this guy before, I hate him even more now, so. Not really many good people in this film. Uh, Sophia pulling herself around on the floor was very well acted. This goes to the well, the great acting I was talking about. You could really feel the struggle and the exhaustion that that character was going through. And notice, there's no music during this, which accentuates her heavy breathing and all those kind of struggling noises that she was making. So that scene was really cool. So not only the acting was awesome, but the sound design worked really well because you could just focus on her struggle. So Andrea knew all these people involved and tries to report on the murders and the first attempted one, he also has no alibi. Yeah, I already said that, sorry. Uh, the killer's recordings make this unique since you never get into the killer's head until the end of a gi giallo usually. I already kind of covered that one. Uh, I don't understand how Traverse, Traversi, who was that um, guy who was wheezing all the time and ended up dying from the heart attack in the uh, garden area, it kind of looked like, or a park. Um, I didn't understand how Traversi can't tell where the killer is when he was being stalked because when he was following Traversi, you know, you have that, you know, killer POV shot. They were making a lot, lot, lot of noise. There was so much rustling. And the fact that he kept, like, looking around like he didn't know, like, he's heard some sort of noise, but has no idea where anything's coming from, ridiculous. Especially because the killer was following very closely. So, that didn't work out very well. Plus, it, that scene takes way too long of him being stalked. This goes back to that kind of, like, things being a bit slow at times, especially when they shouldn't be. I mean, it was just a very long, long time. For that to get done. Uh, Ricardo and Walter act so sus suspicious that you just know it can't be them. Um, yeah, that's another thing is usually when someone's unbelievably suspicious, it's, it's sorry, suspicious, it means they're definitely not the killer. And Ricardo and Walter always going around and talking in secrecy and meeting up, you know, clandestinely here and there and, uh, and then finally being followed by Andrea to that villa. We find out why. Why all the secrecy? Because Ricardo and his friends, a bunch of other older guys, uh, pay Walter to have sex with prostitutes. And then they watch, and they film, and who knows what else they do. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought that was kind of a left field thing that showed up because I wasn't prepared for that. I really wasn't prepared for that. And the way that it gets, like, kind of revealed, like, it's not that big of a deal, I think it's kind of funny. Unless she's the killer, Lou is a terrible, pointless character. And in the end, she was a terrible, pointless character because she was not the killer. Uh, you know, she's, she's another one of those characters that's there to be a red herring, that's there to have some sort of suspicion cast on her at different points. But the fact that she ended up not being the killer, she was an annoying character, she was a really pointless character, she just took up time, and she went nowhere, and she shouldn't have been there. That's one way they could have shaved things down. You know, this film's only like an hour and a half long, but it feels a lot longer because of crap like Lou. How about that interaction where Andrea asks if Lou is going to ask if, she kill, if he killed Isabel, and she says, that's your business. <laughs> I, like... So not only is she just, like, a pointless, like, whatever character, but she's also just, like, I don't even care if you're the killer. Which I guess maybe responding like that would make people suspicious of her, potentially. I don't know. I just saw it as she's a terrible character, and that's, you know, what it ended up being. <laughs> the whole scene with the guy peeping on the people having sex under the bridge is weird, 
and very oddly constructed. The way it's kind of like cuts and like the angle jumps that it makes is very disorienting and it's just weird. And from what I was surmising, that was the, it looked like that was the prostitute's father who was peeping. Weird. Like, I, once again, like, I don't, what was that scene for? Like, what was it for? It really wasn't for anything. I don't know. It's just weird. So the significance of the murders being on Tuesdays has to do with the killer's astrological sign of when they were born and thinking that basically if they kill on a Tuesday, they'll they'll be more favored at that point because that's what their astrology says. Um, I think that's cool. I think it's cool when you have some sort of motive for why a killer is doing something and I think it's fine that it's rooted in kind of wacky stuff like that because obviously people who kill aren't that rooted in reality you know they're very out there uh, they have their own reasons for doing things and reasons that are very much not normal do we need to see Tony close up the uh, or close up the entire house when it, uh, I think Celine is on the phone with her son Tony and she could tell that um, there's potentially something going on, that someone may be coming for him. She tells him to go around and kind of close the, close up everything in the house, and he does it. It's fine to follow him for a little bit and kind of like build that tension, and they do that. But it goes on too long. He goes to way too many rooms. You know, you have to watch him hit the button and have those like gates on the windows come down for way too long. It's just too much. Uh, another one of those things that should have just been cut down. The scene of the killer coming for Tony through the door and in the that narrow concrete corridor, uh, I think that was attached to the garage it looked like, was pretty scary. It looked really good, and especially when it was all dark, but the camera was focusing on the gloved hands, like coming at the camera, was really cool. Um that looked great. And this goes back to what I was saying before. Directing, cinematography, great. It's visually awesome. That was a particularly good scene. It kept the tension way up. It was creepy. It was scary. It was very well done. The kid actor did a good job, too. The chase and fight sequence at the end is pretty entertaining and pretty tense. I did like that. Um, some people may think it went on a little bit too long. I thought it was great. They kept it fresh. They kept it moving at a good pace so that it didn't feel like, okay, are we still doing this? Uh, it went to enough places. Um, it covered enough ground that it was cool. Uh, I enjoyed it. And it, it kind of like ratcheted up the anticipation of finally finding out who the killer is. So I did like that portion of the film. The reveal of John being the killer and the reasoning of wanting Isabel's man is kind of dumb. The reason behind the motivation for the killing, dumb. Uh, and that sucks because it, it stands in such contrast to how everything's set up, like I was talking about with the kind of getting into the mind of the killer early on and those recordings and how creepy they sound. Like you built a good villain and then you reveal their reason for it and you're like, oh, okay, well that's not that interesting. That's not cool. Like... You kind of undid a lot of the coolness. The plot to disguise Isabel's death amongst those of a serial killer, though, is a good idea. And that's been done in at least one other Giallo film I can think of. I won't say which one, because I have a review for it on my channel somewhere, and I don't want to spoil that for anyone if they haven't seen it yet. So just saying. Um, yeah, so some finishing things. Like I said, this cannot be stressed enough. It looks awesome. Directing cinematography, so good. It looks good. Uh, they did a great job finding interesting shapes for shots throughout, through the architecture, like I was talking about before, because of all their locations and the cool architecture. Those uses in a lot of the camera shots are very, very cool. And the kills in this suck. Um, they suck. They're not only kind of poorly constructed, but they're poorly conceived kills. And that's one of the big things, is with Giallo films or with any film where it's a killer going around killing people, even back in the 70s, you needed to be fresh. You needed to be interesting with these kills. Now, this was in 1971, so maybe they didn't need to be as fresh, as new, because this was in the earlier phases of Giallo as a subgenre, and Giallo didn't really fizzle out a whole lot until, I think it was 1974 is when it really started to fizzle out. I was reading online somewhere, so... 
you know, three years before that, so maybe they didn't really need to. But I wish there were much better kills because they were not that great. Just saying. But anyway, I would love to hear other people's opinions on this film if you've seen this. And I hope that you've seen it if you're watching this review because of all these spoilers. So put some comments down there and we'll talk about it. So out of five stars with half stars in play, very conflicted on this one because obviously there are things I really like. Obviously there are things I really don't like. So I'm going to stick it smack dab in the middle and give it a 2.5. I, I thought about going with a 2 because of like the overall story issues and how disappointing the killer is and having too many red herrings and too many people and being too breakneck pace in the beginning. But I also thought about going a three because it looks so great. It's really well acted. There are some cool ideas there. So split it. I'm going to go two and a half. So that makes sense. So yeah, anyway, comments down here. But do me a quick favor if you can, and you can, hit that subscribe button. Uh, that's your best way to repay me if you like this review video or any video I've ever done. Reviews, unboxings, discussions about other things, whatever. Just do that for me, please. Uh, also, if you could hit that notification bell, because that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos for anything. And it helps out if when you see those go up, if you can get on them and watch them immediately, give them some likes and stuff, and helps gain traction. So, But I appreciate that. But regardless, I appreciate you taking your time to watch this video. And until next time, keep it brutal.